What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the fourth episode of our accounting series. Once again, this accounting playlist will be up in the card above, and upcoming videos are timed to release when you need them to. This video is going to talk a little bit more about something that's a little bit different from account management. Um, it's internal control, and that's the ways that businesses prevent fraud and management. We're also going to cover how to account for the time lag between the recording transactions between the bank side and the book side, also known as a bank reconciliation. This is really important for businesses to maintain an accurate balance of how much you really usable cash they have on hand. Now let's get started with episode 4, Internal Control and Cash. Now, fraud is one of the biggest problems plaguing cash management in businesses. Fraud, in basic essence, is just an intentional misrepresentation of facts, so for the purpose of persuading another party to act in a certain way. And so this seeks to benefit the individual that's involved and damages the businesses in the process. And with the growth of e-commerce, fraud is only on the rise. The main motivations of fraud can be shown with a broad triangle shown here. There's the motive, the opportunity caused by a certain lack of security within the business that someone is seeking to exploit, and rationalization. They believe that this is a right thing to do. And for, for example, taking money from the business to suit your own needs and the two main types of fraud are misappropriation of assets, which is like theft, bribery, and the overstating of expenses, as well as fraudulent financial reporting. This is known in the books, uh, in the accounting terms, as clipping books, basically making false journal entries to deceive investors and creditors. So the main purpose for internal control is to prevent, detect, and correct fraud. They consist of methods of business organization and procedures and they try to accomplish five main objectives. One, to safeguard assets. Two, to encourage employees to follow company policy. Three, to promote efficiency. Four, comply with legal requirements. And five, ensure accurate and reliable accounting records. So audits are to make sure that these kind of systems are adequate and keeping the business efficient, its records accurate, and that its practices comply with all laws and regulations. A good system of internal controls keeps out fraud, waste, and inefficiency, leading to less lost time and money for businesses. There is a risk assessment, which comes from the fireplace and goes up to the chimney. That identifies risks to the business and establishes procedures to quell any damage. There is an information system, which is shown through like the front desk. That essentially tracks all the money coming in and out, profits, loss, assets. And so there's also these things called control procedures which is basically kind of the front door or the main point of entrance to the house. And so that's basically how companies gain access to the main system and the five objectives we mentioned earlier that are used um, to monitor internal control. And there's the monitoring controls like the windows and the security system. And these kind of things take, uh, take the form of internal and external auditors that regulate the system, as well as embed technology that can flag potential irregularities as well as suspicion. So these are the procedures that businesses use to actually maintain internal control. These are such that any system and any employee has checks and balances to prevent unrestricted access to sensitive details. This can be remembered through the acronym SCALP. The S in SCALP in the first letter stands for Smart Hiring Practices in the Separation of Duties. This takes the form of clearly defined job descriptions, background checks, requisite training, as well as supervision to ensure trustworthiness. And sometimes though, that isn't enough. And the most important thing about this category is the separation of handling, record keeping, as well as transaction approval. This is because when those tasks are taken responsibility by a single employee, it gives them the chance to represent, or sorry, misrepresent those facts as well as cover it up with fake accounting records, which we want to avoid. Now, the second letter, C in Scalp, stands for the comparisons and compliance monitoring. Once again, this separates the processing and the monitoring of transactions across multiple departments. For example, signing checks, recording and reconciling bank statements, which is the responsibility of the controller, by the way, uh, cross-checking with the budget, and noting deviations with the exception reporting. Compliance monitoring also takes the form of auditing, which is an external body that ensures everything that takes place is perfectly legal. All right, so A stands for adequate records, which constitute backup copies and hard copies of business transactions and records. These are often numbered in sequence to make sure everything is processed and reported accurately and holes in the data are easily noticed. L stands for limited access, so 
Limited access, well, we don't want one particular employee to have an unrestricted access to the whole system. This takes the form of physical access controls as well as encryption, so that only certain employees can have access. These employees often rotate their positions to prevent one person having full knowledge of the system. And P stands for proper approvals. The bigger the transaction, the more serious it is, and the more specific approval it should have. Every single transaction needs approval, and only approved vendors are allowed to for purchase. Some of the limitations of uh, internal control procedures are collusion. Collusion is essentially the act of two or more multiple employees collaborating together to, um, to con commit fraud or misattribution. Um, these procedures kind of have they have expansive barriers for individual people to for it, they have barriers for individual people to commit fraud. But for collusion for multiple people they're kind of less effective, but they're still very effective. Um, in addition, the more expansive the internal control system, the more cost, the more red tape is involved, and generally the more dissatisfaction, less efficient the business can get. And in addition, internal control systems can be judged with their costs and benefits. So it can help these systems be more efficient while still maintaining security and um, accuracy in the records as well as complacent, uh, compliance with laws. Safeguard controls are, they're essentially an extension of these procedures and they are like the minute details that are what allow these procedures to take place. They include security and fireproof vaults for protected documents or fidelity bonds that reimburse against cashiers and robberies and employee rotation and mandatory vacations to prevent an employee accessing company data outside trusted locations. All right, so internal control of cash takes the form of two main categories, receipts and payments. The methods that are used to maintain control of receipts at the counter are the point of sale terminals, which match electronic transactions with cash turned in and inventory records. The change in cash and cash drawers, as well as the inventory changes and the paper receipts and backups are all combined and aggregated by the accounting department. And that's essentially that provides the internal control. They're all combined, there's a bunch of backup systems, and that's what takes in what is expended and what is um, received in cash over the counter. For cash receipts by mail, essentially what is received in the mail room is a combination of a check and a remittance advice. They're usually grouped together in one document. The checks are transferred to the treasurer, which goes on to the bank, and the remittance advices come together and are added to cash by the controller. These remittance advices, they look kind of like individual journal entries. So whenever they go to the accounting department, they aggregate all of that up into essentially collections. Now, companies make the most of payments by check or EFT. EFT stands for electronic funds transfer. Now, these are signed authorized documents that provide a record of payment. There are four steps to this process, and each of these steps are separated between different employees that essentially serve as the internal control. These steps are purchasing goods, receiving goods, preparing the check or EFT for payment, and the approval of payment. Now, all these payments are also known as invoices, as I'm sure you've heard that term. Petty cash can also be used as a third method for the, all those kind of minor expenses that are needed in a business. It's open with a particular set amount of cash, let's say $2,000, and a custodian prepares a petty cash voucher list that is distributed to the people who need to pay for those things. Like for instance, the coffee for a board meeting or whatever it might be. These are all accounted for using the, um, this kind of system where it's the sum of the current fund value plus the vouchers that are already, um, that are already paid should equal the specific balance. All right, a bank reconciliation's purpose is to adjust the balance between the book side and the bank side due to timing differences and error. The reason is that cash is kept in the bank account because banks can keep cash safe. Now, some documents that are used to control the cash include a signature card, a deposit ticket, a check, and a bank statement. The bank reconciliation is literally just an adjusting entry that just adds in the difference between a bank balance and the company's cash account. All right, so the bank side, basically what is received uh, by the company from the bank is a bank statement, which occurs around every month and it essentially just gives you the amount of outstanding checks, deposits, withdrawals, that kind of thing. So, the first thing 
that is added as an adjustment to the bank side is deposits in transit. On the bank side, you would have to add deposits in transit because these are recorded on the business side as cash is being delivered to the bank, but not on the bank side. So it's recorded on the company side first, but it takes a while for the cash get uh, transferred and processed and stuff. The second thing is outstanding checks. They're issued by the company that are that is not yet paid by the bank. So they have to be added to the bank accounts. This means they've already been recorded as checks and entries for the use checks have already been made on the company side. I don't know when the, ca the cash gets, how when the ca check gets cash, that's when the transaction makes it to the bank. The third thing is bank errors. The corrections for accounting errors are added as the traffic on the bank side. Now on the book side, there's seven things we're gonna talk about. The first thing is bank collections. Now these are cash receipts on the accounts or notes receivable side that are not yet recorded in cash. As such, they are recorded in the bank um, when the collections have not been received, have been received, sorry. But there is a lag between it being recorded on the bank statement, so it does need to be added on the book side for some time. Now, the second thing is EFTs. EFTs are electronic fund transfers, as we said before. And once again, when the transaction goes through the bank's side, it gets recorded first. So it needs to be added or subtracted on the book side. Now with the service charges, it's simply just a transaction processing fee. So it's subtracted from the book balance. Now with interest revenue, this is simply interest revenue on the checking account. So it's added to the book balance. And now NSF checks essentially occur when a customer has insufficient funds to pay a check. That check is essentially not worth anything and it's basically bounced. And what this means is that, that it's uh, accrued for in, in accounts receivable, not cash. And that goes to something called uncollected revenue, which we're gonna cover in a future episode, so stay tuned for that. And that is essentially just subtracted from the book side because that doesn't go toward the cash collection. Now, the sixth thing is the cost of printed checks. For the cost of printed checks, it's also a service charge that can be subtracted. And book errors, the seventh thing, are things that are added or subtracted to account for the corrections that are made for them. But when cash is recorded on the balance sheet, it's recorded as two different terms, cash and cash equivalents. Cash equivalents are highly liquid investments that are not pure cash, but they are they mature at less than three months from the date of purchase. They're essentially right about to be converted to cash. So with that said, that's a wrap on our fourth episode in our BPA, UIL, and College Accounting series. I hope you guys like this video. Make sure you guys hit the subscribe and like button down below to stay tuned for some future videos where we're gonna be covering more advanced accounting concepts just like um, uncollected revenue, etc. Peace.